Can you see me? You've got me stopped, Tanya. Hi, everybody. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. I know everyone has been really busy adjusting to the new normal, but I'm so glad that you could join us for our part two session of keeping your clients out of the courtroom. Um, please note that uh, this webinar is being recorded, and we are live on Facebook. So I'm going to go over the agenda really, really quickly. I'm going to introduce myself for those of you that don't know me, and then I will introduce the lovely Tanya. We are going to do some housekeeping tips. Um, then we will go into some legislative updates and then into the meat and the potatoes of why you've come here to join us today, which is avoiding common real estate issues. Time is of the essence clauses, undisclosed defects, active concealments, and mixed-use commercial and residential properties, which I promise you is going to be eye-opening and draw, draw, dropping on that one because... Uh, that one was it's going to be good the please also keep in mind that this is general information purposes only and it's not to be construed as independent legal advice so for those of you that don't know me my name is kendra conley i am a global real estate advisor with sotheby's international realty i am a multi-million dollar award-winning producer i love what i do if you ever have any questions, please reach out to me. No obligations, no pressure. My job is to educate you, not tell you what to do, which is why I love uh, hosting these webinars to educate not only fellow colleagues, but uh, buyers and sellers and everybody out there. Without further ado, I am very excited to introduce Tanya Walker. She is an amazing woman. She has uh, been a trial lawyer for 14 years and is a creator of Walker Law. She has successfully argued disputes in various levels of court, including the Court of Appeal, which by the way, is the highest court in Ontario. Walker Law has a wealth of experience in dealing with real property disputes. And we will actually talk about some of those disputes today. Tanya has also earned numerous awards throughout her duration of her career, including the 2019 Osgood Hall Gold Key Award, which I personally would love a gold key. And Tanya also regularly, uh, regularly appears as a legal expert on numerous TV stations, including CTV, CBC News, and City Pulse 24. Today would absolutely not be possible if it wasn't for a lovely young lady named Natasha Papalkis. She is an articling student with Walker Law. She graduated in 2020 from the University of New Brunswick Law School. And I'm so excited. She is expected to be called to the bar and on um, the Ontario bar in June of 2021. And uh, we We all know that that is a lot of hard work. So congratulations and we're excited for you, Natasha. So we have two objectives today. Provide tips on how to protect your clients from ending up in court. And number two, tell you how to prevent real estate transactions from falling apart. Those to me, by the way, are probably the most two important things that I like to do in my job. So a couple of housekeeping tips. Last time we did the seminar, we got some great feedback and somebody shared with us that people were having a hard time being able to see the speaker and the presentation itself. So if you scroll down, there is an option, which is a side by side mode, and that should allow you to see the presentation Responding to polls. So today's webinar is going to have a number of polls in order to make this webinar more active and engaging. I love it. I think it's so much fun. We like to also include these polls because then it gives us an idea of where your perspective is at. So how it works is the poll menu is going to drop down. You're going to click on the answer or hope that you clicked on the right answer. 
we will then share the poll, or then you're going to hit submit. We will then share the poll results with you. And then Tanya is just going to set us straight and tell us what's right, what's wrong, and what's the law. For those of you that are watching this webinar and interacting on a mobile phone, keep in mind that it might look slightly a little bit different for you. Some of you submitted questions before you or while you registered, and some of you will have questions for us while uh, we're going through this uh, webinar. So please feel free to just ask those questions whenever you want. You don't have to wait until we get to a section where we ask anybody if they have any questions. Um, and Tanya's team behind the scenes will get those uh, questions actually started, uh, answered, and get them to Tanya and myself. And then also keeping in mind that for privacy reasons, we will only um, use your initials when you're asking the question. As mentioned a couple of seconds ago, we appreciate any feedback. We did get great feedback from the last seminar. So right after this uh, webinar, you will be sent an email, uh, any feedback, Back that you send us will be appreciated. You will also see in that email there is a link to this webinar in case you want to go back and reference anything. And there will also be links to future webinars. So Tanya has a webinar in a couple of days. I'm excited about this one. We can all use a little bit more information on contract law. And so you will also see the link in that email where you can register for the next uh, for the next webinar. Tanya and I have been discussing and in discussion with a lovely tax lawyer. We have realized, or I also realized that along the way that a lot of people always have have tax questions, international uh, law or law tax questions, uh, people that invest in properties, taxes, how does that all work? People that are immigrating um, to the country and so on, how do those taxes work? What about when you're an international and you want to sell that property and so on? So we are going to be featuring a wonderful tax lawyer um, in the next seminar, and we're hoping to have that before the end of the year, but we will let you know when that one is. The roadmap for today looks like this. Step one, we're gonna do the polls to understand your perspective. Step two, we discuss and correct and answer uh, uh, the, the questions and then we discuss the law. We will then discuss on how to protect your clients from going forward. And step four, we will pause to answer any questions that you may have before we move on. And once again, for those of you that submitted questions while you registered, we have put those questions into today's webinar. And again, we will only be using people's initials for privacy reasons. So let's get to our first poll question. Which of today's topics interests you the most? A, legislative updates. B, time is of the essence clauses. C, defects on title. D, active concealment. And then E, mixed use of residential and commercial properties. So just plop on which one uh, interests you and hit the submit button. I'm doing it with you guys. We'll give everybody a couple of seconds to further, and then we'll see what people want to talk about today, Tanya. So it looks like 8% said legislative updates, 12% said time is of the essence clauses, 23% defects on title. I know, I love that one too. 12% said active concealment and 46% said mixed use residential and commercial properties. So now we know what people want to talk about. So without further ado, I would love to have Tanya join us now and she's going to lead us off with some quick legislative updates. Welcome, Tanya. Hi, Kendra. Thank you for having me today and good after good morning, everybody. Um, I'm happy to excite I'm excited to present to you today. Um, I'll start off with the federal government and effective on July the 1st, the Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation tightened the standards for those who may qualify for a mortgage in situations if the down payment is less than 20% of the total purchase price of the property. This essentially will protect the home buyers and reduce risk. This has resulted in the reduction of the allocation of the buyer's income that can be paid towards the mortgage and other debt, 
which means loosening the stress test. The credit score of a buyer must be higher, now at least 680 instead of 600, and the home buyer must use their own funds for a down payment as opposed to borrowing a portion of the 20% through a loan. Also, almost two weeks ago, the Prime Minister announced that requirements for first time home buyers would be relaxed to encourage home ownership. Further particulars have yet to be provided. While looking at our provincial government, on September 26, the government of Ontario ordered strip clubs to close and last call to sell alcohol at bars, restaurants, and nightclub at 11 o'clock p.m. Also, bars and restaurants must remain closed between midnight and five o'clock a.m. Effective this past Saturday, which was October the 3rd, the government of Ontario made into law further restrictions specifically for our Toronto, Ottawa, and Peel region due to the higher than average rates of transmission. In those regions, group exercise classes at gyms and other fitness facilities are limited to 10 individuals. The total number of people allowed at facilities, such as banquet halls, is now a maximum of 50 in total instead of 50 per room. Also, any business which has not reopened due to COVID will not reopen for at least another 28 days. Some businesses that may be affected are ones that were ordered to close due to COVID, such as restaurants on King West. These restrictions are likely to affect the revenue of business owners and ability to pay rent. Also effective on October the 1st, the Helping Tenants and Small Businesses Act became law. There will be a freeze of residential rent for many tenants in 2021. It will also permit commercial tenants whose landlords qualify for the Commercial Emergency Rent Relief Program to pay 25% of rent in 2021. In I elaborated on this extensively on September the 24th in a commercial property law webinar. I urge you to watch it on our YouTube channel if you want to hear more detail about this law. On October the 1st, the government also announced the first phase of the regulatory change related to the Trust in Real Estate Services Act. Now real estate professionals may incorporate and be paid through personal real estate corporations, which may end up reducing their tax obligations and more disposable income to bring home. Salespeople and brokers must use additional advertising terms such as real estate agent and realtor in their advertisements as it will better reflect the services they provide to consumers across the province. Now looking at the City of Toronto, on September 30th, the City of Toronto imposed tighter restrictions on restaurants and bars and there is a reduction of the number of people seated at a table from 10 to 6 Restaurants are required to collect contact information from each patron at the table and background music must be lowered to the level of the conversation. The City of Toronto is also discussing implementing a vacant home tax, which will affect those who purchase property and let it sit vacant to sell it at a profit at a later date or even those who use it as an Airbnb. It will vote on the feasibility of this in December and I have seen mentioned a 5% tax. Right now in Vancouver, the vacancy tax is equivalent to approximately 1.25% of the value of a home if it's not the owner's principal residence or if it is deemed to be unrented for six months of the year or more. Now looking at the courts, what's interesting in this situation is that different regions have created their own policies so it's not consistent across the province. For example, the most recent change was on September 25th Central West, which includes Brampton and Milton courts, announced the expansion of dealing with matters by video conference, such as pretrials, which are settlement meetings with a judge. On a personal note, I have participated in a few pretrials by Zoom, and I've found that they are productive, perhaps even more productive than a settlement meeting with a judge in person. One reason is that court staff, which may be unionized, have to lock up the physical courtroom usually around 4 30, 5 o'clock. But during a pretrial with a judge, if there isn't court staff present, the judge is not in, the judge is open to staying a little bit longer with us to help us settle. But what I have found challenging is that when we settle, the judge is not in the room with us to ensure the settlement documents are signed. So for those lawyers who have signed up, have gotten around this, as I have asked the judge to put in the court order that if we encounter any difficulty with settling, settling or signing settlement documents, we may request another attendance before that judge. Mm -hmm. I have had to do that twice in one month on two different cases. And the only reason that the court's administrative staff agreed to schedule this is because we have a court say, order saying that this may be done. 
And although this is not legislation, I thought it was kind of interesting. And it should be noted that the Toronto-based Landlord Credit Bureau, which is used by almost 30,000 landlords and property managers across Canada and the USA, is partnering with Equifax to create an online portal that tracks tenants with rent payments so that resulting data can be incorporated into credit files. Landlords will now have the ability to affect the credit rating of a tenant based on if the rent tenant pays rent on time. So moving on to the next section, and I will spend a little bit time, more time on the mixed commercial residential properties because almost half of you are interested in that topic. One question from CB when CB registered is, was can a landlord sue protesters if the sheriff cannot enforce an eviction order? And thank you for your question, CB. I believe this is in response to the commercial property law webinar that I spoke at, where I explained that there are situations where protesters are blocking the sheriff from evicting someone from their home after the landlord has obtained an order for that person to leave. And the short answer is yes, but you might need to look at how realistic a lawsuit can be or would be. So the starting point is that the charter provides that you have the right to a peaceful assembly, but it doesn't take into account violence or blocking someone from enforcing a lawful order. And now looking at a lawsuit, you have to first look at number one, are you even able to identify the protester? And number two, the feasibility of suing, can, will you collect? So what I mean by that is, and it's important to keep in mind that a judge at trial will write whether or not you've won the trial next step is it's up to you to collect. And so if a protester is not working or does not have assets such as ownership of a home, then it might be difficult for you to seize the assets and force the sale of them. And so it might not be feasible. And also suing protesters may result in bringing more attention to the cause. And a question from YR is uh, non-renewal of leases due to discrimination. And I think what you're we're alluding to is that recent case that has been decided, Elias Restaurant, and what happened in this situation is that the tenants who are a black married couple, they own an African Caribbean restaurant. The lease was going to expire and the tenants made several efforts to communicate with the landlord their desire to renew the lease for another five years, which is an option under the lease. Despite this, the landlord deliberately avoided communicating with the tenants regarding the lease renewal and then said the restaurant does not attract family-oriented customers and detracts from the appeal of the plaza for families. The court formed an opinion that based on the facts of the existence of anti-Black racism in Canada, that the testimony of the landlord fit with the long-time and well-known biases towards Black business people. The court ordered that the lease be renewed for five years and that the tenants could not be evicted unless the tenants do not comply with the lease. So, the short answer is if you're able to demonstrate discrimination, the other side may be ordered to continue the business relationship with you. And um, I'll ask Kendra to step in and answer the last question. There's a question from BR. Is my client personally able to replace old windows in a condominium? Kendra will answer this and move on to the next section. Thank you, Tanya. And just to add in regards to qualifying for your mortgage that the credit score is now uh, it has to be a little higher. Also keep in mind that only one of the borrowers has to have that credit score of 680. The, if you have a partner who has a slightly less uh, credit score, that's okay. Um, so uh, can your client replace old windows in a condominium? The short answer is normally no, because in a condominium, everything that is on the outside of the, bin, the, the building itself, the walls, the doors, the windows, the roof, et cetera, are owned and governed by the condominium corporation. Should you decide to go ahead and replace windows yourself, you are opening yourself up to having to, uh, for the, that the condominium corporation can then place on title of your property that you have gone ahead and you have touched the outside of the building, you were not given permission to do so. And there, so therefore moving forward into the future, inevitably, you are then responsible for any defects that may happen. So five years down the road, all of a sudden there's some type of leak, 
uh, they think it can be put towards or show that it was because you changed those windows, you are then responsible. You sell your property and two years down the road, the same thing happens. The new owners are responsible. So it follows, it stays on title of your property. So the short answer shouldn't. So now we're going to go into part four of time is of the essence. And one of the reasons why I wanted to discuss this was because I tend to find in, especially in real estate, when we're going back and forth with the agreement of purchase and sale or any contracts whatsoever, we tend to find that there is dates and times where the <clears throat> the deal is still alive and or certain things must happen within that period of time. So for an example, if you have a conditional period of a home home inspection and the home inspection is due at 5 p.m. on Friday, you must do that home inspection or fulfill that uh, condition before 5 p.m on Friday. And sometimes when these deadlines are not met, buyers and sellers like to try and use that as ways to get out of the deal. So we're going to go into the poll now. We're going to give you an example. The question is, you are buying a condo. The agreement of purchase and sale states that the seller must provide the buyer with the condo status certificate in five days. The seller takes seven days to provide it. And as a result, you end up being 20 minutes late to provide the funds on the closing date. Is the seller obligated to sell the condo to you? So I also want to note here that the agreement of purchase and sale states that the seller must provide the status certificate, not order the status certificate, which is what we put in a lot of the time. So again, is the seller obligated to sell the condo to you? A, yes, B, no, C, it depends, or D, completely unsure. Please choose your answer and hit the submit button. We will give you a couple of more seconds and then Tanya is gonna give us the results. <clears throat> Wow. Okay. Is the seller obligated to sell the condo to you? Tanya, 48% said yes. 17% said no. 30% said it depends. And 4% were unsure. So what's the answer? Hi, Kendra. So the answer, the majority got it right, that the deal, the answer is A, that the deal is not over and the parties will need to close. And so the starting point is when an agreement of purchase and sale says time is of the essence. It usually means that both sides must be in a position to close at a specified time and date. A similar situation happened in the case called Fortress, which is cited at the bottom of the slide for those who may want to review it, where instead of being late, the seller actually delivered the wrong certificate and then delivered the correct certificate in time for closing. The buyer then paid the closing funds around 20 minutes late. The seller said that because he provided the correct certificate in time for closing, he was not wrong. And as such, the purchaser who delivered the funds late was wrong. The seller believed that because the buyer was wrong, the seller did not have to sell the property to that buyer and could keep the deposit. This case was appealed to the Court of Appeal, which as Kendra mentioned is the highest court in Ontario and binds lower courts. It's also one step below the Supreme Court of Canada. It agreed with the lower court that when the seller delivered the wrong certificate, regardless if it was delivered on time, he was in breach of contract and could not rely on time is of the essence. His responsibility at that point is to work out with the purchaser an extension of the closing date. The buyer was ordered to close as the seller need, really needed this property for a commercial purpose. So to avoid this in the future, if you represent or you are the buyer who has been wrong, just tender the funds on time to avoid the fortress problem where the seller might say, I don't need to sell to you and I can keep your deposit. And G asked what happens when both parties are in the wrong. And the answer is try to work with the other side to close at a reasonable date. So looking at any questions before we move on, I'll ask Kendra to uh, chime in for the question, to answer the question from PG and I'll answer the other two. But PG asked, what is developing in terms of COVID-19 related clauses in the 
purchase and sale agreements. Kendra? So the most common ones that we are starting to see at this point in time solely have, are, are around closing dates. So we are starting to see clauses in regards to should a buyer or a seller become ill due to COVID and are unable to close on a certain closing date that the other party accepts that and you know there isn't any lawsuits trying to come out of that or whatever and so on. The other one that we're seeing is that should the buyers or sellers not be able to close simply because, you know, in the future, something drastic happens, for an example, registry office closes and so on, and it's just impossible to close, then once the registry office opens, you know, we'll then close 14 days after the, the office reopens. So it's it's really clauses in regards to the closing dates and either party's becoming ill or something like a registry office not being open and closing down. Thanks, Kendra. So looking at the questions from GS and DS, uh, they both ask about tenanted properties. Is a seller liable if the tenant doesn't disclose COVID exposure or illness? And how about vacant possession? And the answer is to avoid this problem with tenanted properties. Um, I've discussed these questions with Kendra before our webinar. And uh, I agree with her recommendation is that you list the property when it is actually vacant so you can avoid any problems with vacant possession or contracting COVID. Now, I haven't seen any cases dealing with someone suing uh, another person because they contacted uh, COVID or contracted COVID after they moved into the property. But um, what you would need to consider is number one, liability. Can you prove that that uh, transmission was due from the tenant? And also, if you're thinking about suing the seller, then you should you need to prove that the seller knew or should have known that a tenant had COVID. The second point is damages. What are your damages as a result of getting COVID? The worst case scenario, unfortunately, you may pass away. But if nothing, you don't have to miss any work. You can you're fine and you're functional. Um, you may not have any damages. And that's what I have to deal with when I'm before a judge. Liability and number two, damages. So the second question is from SF, landlord and tenant rights during the pandemic. And the rights right now have essentially reverted to what they once were, as there was a freeze of enforcing eviction orders, which ended at the end of August. The main change for the pandemic is or that came up from the pandemic is the Protecting Tenants and Strengthening Community Housing Act, which became law on July 21st. And a fundamental change to that landlord tenant law is that landlords do not have to provide notice to a tenant if they want an order to evict the tenant in the circumstance where the landlord and tenant previously agreed to a timetable to pay rental arrears that was made into an order by the tribunal and now the tenant has violated the order. So if the landlord and tenant have agreed on a, a timetable, which was then made into an order by the, the board, and then the tenant violated it, all the landlord needs to do to get an eviction order is to submit that with an affidavit without providing notice. I discussed this extensively on CTV's Your Morning on August the 10th, because the city of Toronto voted in favor of starting a court proceeding against the province of Ontario due to this law, because the city believes that notice should be provided to the tenant before that tenant may be evicted. And so at the moment, landlords are encouraged to work with tenants to come up with arrangements for rent. And if tenants cannot work or must self-isolate and have difficulty paying rent, the province continues to encourage landlords and tenants to work together. So Kendra will move on to the undisclosed defects. So Tanya, before we do that, if you don't mind, um, AM has a question and I think it's a great question because it is something in the last few days that is really starting to happen. And we're actually starting to see news, news articles about this and so on. And um, I've, I've had numerous colleagues who have had this problem. It's regarding the, the deposit not showing up. So in, in, in real estate, as we all 
people know, you put in an offer, uh, and then once that offer is accepted, you have 24 hours to drop off that deposit to either the real estate lawyer and or the listing agent's brokerage. But what we are starting to see is that because there's this bit of a, a buying frenzy again happening, and it's become extremely competitive, we are seeing a lot of aggressive offers over asking, no conditions, and then all of a sudden, the buyers aren't coming forward with the deposit check and are just ghosting. So his question is, in the spirit of protecting your seller clients, if you're the listing agent, how much due diligence do you have to do on the buyers if they're not your client? Or what do you even do in that situation? Yes. Uh, so Kendra, do you want to answer it? Or would you like me to? Well, I would like you to answer that one because that's just a, I wouldn't even, I'm, 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 I have the same question. <laughs> <laughs> I actually, I saw that. I, I saw that know. article in the newspaper. I can't remember which paper, but I did see that online. That's yes. a problem. And I thought to myself, what I would do is uh, have a clause or a paragraph in the agreement of uh, purchase and sale that says that the funds must be submitted within a certain period of time, like within 24 hours by certified check or bank draft, failing which this offer is null and void. That's what I, that's the way I would get around it. Okay. Right. So just sort of at the end. So really, because in our agreements, a person state purchase of sale, it actually states that it states that the, that the deposit deposit check must be uh, delivered within that 24 hour period. So you're just saying, put that in again and, and simply state that if the, it's not delivered to this specific location by this time, the deal is automatically null and void. Yes, I would have that. And um, I, I see AM also asked about how much due diligence do you have to do on the buyers if they're not your clients? I, I'm, I'm not sure because I'm a, like I'm a lawyer, so I'm not sure how much due diligence you're, you would, would have to do. But if I were to present this to a judge and if I don't represent, if the agent doesn't represent the buyer, then I wouldn't expect the agent to do any due diligence on the buyer unless the agent knew or should have known that the buyer would not fulfill their end of the deal. Yeah, yeah, that's what I figured as, as well. Okay. So, okay, so Andrew, if you have any further questions in regards to that or need some clarity, please continue to ask your questions. So let's go on to undis undisclosed defects because I've ran into these before. I think it's very interesting um, how we trade in, transactions happen all the time and, and this actually comes up all the time. So an example would be how many times have we gone into a house with our buyer and we can see that the house has an addition on it. Uh, or the other one I always question is, is that it, it, um, in Toronto is uh, in certain neighborhoods and so on is those like second story balconies that you can tell were definitely built afterwards. And you, you kind of questioned you even walk out on that balcony. But the second question in your head is, 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 was, is this law, is this legal or were they allowed to build this? Did they take out permits? So let's go on to the poll question, which is you were buying a house with an addition. Before closing, you find out that the addition is illegal because the necessary permits were not obtained. Do you have an obligation to close? So your answer choices are A, yes, B, no, C, unsure, or D, it depends. And the only reason I get all of these right is because Tanya and I have already discussed them. <laughs> <laughs> Kendra, you could take the credit. Okay, so I'll end this in about two seconds. I'm excited to see what these ones are. Ooh, I knew it was going to be close. Okay, so Hi. do you have an obligation to close? 29% said 18% were honest and they said it depends and 29% or sorry unsure and 29% said it depends so isn't that cool so yes 29% it depends 29% so Tanya take it away enlighten well, us uh, the, the, the answer is a yes you have an obligation to close and this answer is a question from many of you as you can see at the bottom of the screen that what happens when there are home additions or work without permits. Uh, to back up a little bit, uh, last webinar Kendra and I did together, we spoke about patent defects and latent defects. And patent 
defects is one that you can see and a latent is one like mold or termites that you cannot see. So it must be disclosed to you. And in the situation of additions, you are likely to see the addition exists. So it's important that you satisfy yourself that it's legal before you close. How you would satisfy yourself that it is legal is to request information from the seller if a permit was requested, obtained, and then closed. Also, some additions are just not that obvious to see. So you should ask if there are any additions and request information on it to determine if it was constructed legally. So Why, I, sorry, Tanya, I'm going to interrupt you there for a second. You know, what's interesting was I went with a buyer to look at a house yesterday. And when we walked into the basement, the basement was a quarter of the size of the house. And it was like, where's the rest of the basement? There should be, a, it should extend out here and it should extend out there. And it was just so confusing. And then we went out, we looked outside again and were there additions and it was hard to tell in this and the other. And the interesting thing was, was there was plumbing going down from the kitchen into an area that you could not access. And when I spoke to the listing agent this morning, he said, yeah, there's, according to the home inspector, there's no access to there. It's not a crawl space. They don't really know. They bought it seven years ago. They don't have the information from the previous sellers because it was a divorce and there wasn't a lot of communication. And that's all the info I have. And so when I took that back to my buyer this morning, he just said, I'm out, right? Because <laughs> that wasn't enough information for him. So I just thought that was quite interesting considering we were discussing these. I mean, the good thing about... Uh... The webinars today. and the case law, it opens your eyes to things that you probably might have not considered before. Kendra, are you still with me? I am. Yes. Yeah, sorry. Okay. Yes. yes. So, so it, 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 it's, uh, it's an interesting because I think permits, building additions is the way that to go in Toronto because there's just so much, only so much space. So it's, it's good to satisfy yourself that it's constructed legally. And if there's something that kind of doesn't make sense, you have to um, investigate a little bit more. And so, I also, I think in the future, Tanya, you, it wouldn't surprise me if you start to see some cases coming forward in regards to laneway houses. Mm -hmm. I have seen some already. Okay, um, there you go. <laughs> so, <laughs> this is a suggestion uh, at, that I made based on the discussion that Kendra and I ha had last week. And one, the suggestion is if you represent the buyer you may want to put this in your agreement of purchase and sale or some an alter like you can alter it a little bit but basically to say that the seller warrants that there aren't any outstanding work orders or deficiency notices affecting the property and that its presence use is lawful so that means in the future that if you find out if it that it isn't lawful or there are any notices that you can ask the seller to compensate you for any work that you have to do to make it lawful and so an example of this type of situation is in the 567 College Street case. And in this situation, the third floor of property was being used for residential units when the agreement of purchase and sale was entered into. And after the agreement was entered into, the buyer discovered the third floor was illegally converted into rental units by the previous owner. So to get out of the deal, the buyer then told the city that this was the case. And so the city issued a work order and then the buyer said, well, since a work order has been issued, I like a reduction in purchase price due to this work order. The court in this situation said that the seller, or sorry, the buyer should have satisfied itself that it was legal before submitting a binding offer. So the buyer should have requested information on the legality of the third floor, especially because in this situation, it was actually permitted in the agreement of purchase and sale, but the buyer just chose not to do so. So looking at any questions before we move on, there is a question from DM that I'll answer and Kendra will answer the rest. Um, and the question is, what happens when there's a failure to close transactions? So if it's the fault of the buyer, the seller gets to keep the deposit regardless if the property is sold for a higher purchase price. There are stipulations, but that's the golden rule of thumb. And if it's the fault of the seller, the buyer may be able to get damages for any rental costs or any costs due to this, 
or if the, the buyer is able to demonstrate to a court that the property is very specific and needed for like a specific purpose, then the court may order for it to be sold anyway. So Kendra, um, could you answer the questions from PT and BR, the impact of COVID on the condo market and rental prices? So we have seen a decrease in regards to the rental prices for the condo market. Uh, numerous reasons for this. Uh, we have seen obviously short-term rentals like our uh, Airbnbs all of a sudden not being able to uh, fill their units. So therefore they're going from short-term rentals onto long-term rentals. So those units are coming on onto the market. And the biggest impact that we've also seen this year was because a lot of international students did not return to Toronto this year and therefore did not sort of soak up all those uh, leases that were that uh, that are available. And that's a huge chunk of our, our market as well. People probably don't realize. So um, with the influx of Airbnbs becoming long term leases and then the international students. Um, not soaking up the inventory. We've had an influx of um, of these of these leases coming up, and therefore supply and demand will tell you that the the, mar the prices will they, they then come down. The interesting thing that then sort of would make some common sense to that would be so for an example I have a client who leased a property for three thousand dollars a year or a month decided to end his lease legally ended his lease at the end of the year and that unit is now back on the market for twenty four hundred dollars now um, so it's been a significant drop it's been very, it's become very competitive and when an investor cannot cover the payments in regard with the rental income, then we then will then start to see some of these uh, lease these leases these rentals then switching from being a long term lease over to actually being for sale. So it'll be very interesting to see what happens over the next little while in regards to the condo market prices. So looking at the question from RD, uh, RD is asking you, Kendra, should there be a reassignment or rent a condo? So I, I actually really like this question now because Tanya and I had a, a great little uh, uh, discussion about this. So in it's best to rent out a condo first. And the reason being is that if you reassign, you're looking for a specific buyer that A has a large deposit because you have to normally match the same deposit that you've already given the builder. And you're asking somebody to purchase a unit that is sight unseen. They haven't seen it. It's not tangible. It's not finished yet. Whereas a larger pool of buyers will actually, uh, will, will, will purchase a condo after it's been completed. And I always say pleaded before you sell it, you then also want to wait until the building is done. So all of the trucks have left, they've taken off all of the wood out of the, uh, the construction company has taken all of the wood out of the elevators, and the amenities are actually completed. However, considering what is going on in the rental market right now, and considering um, the less rights that landlords have, and you're taking a chance that your tenant loses their job due to what is going on with the COVID and so on, and then not all of a sudden being able to pay their rent and so on, it's probably a better idea to reassign at the moment. So at the moment I would reassign and in a normal market, I would consider renting out the condo for a year before selling it. Um, I can just take the next question and move forward. The next question from HS is where is the market headed? This is where I wish I could take out my crystal ball and dust it off and give you guys an idea of where the market is headed. We don't know, I, we have no idea. I can share with you that I am seeing things <clears throat> I am seeing things, I'm not seeing the Bank of Canada doing things, I'm seeing C, uh, CMH, uh, CHMC doing things that I've actually never seen before. 
for. We are also going for, uh, seeing a record unemployment rate and we are seeing people losing their jobs left and right. And we have, I don't like the number, the 16% of people that defer their mortgages. I mean, even if we uh, readjust that number and said it was even half of that or eight to 10% were really in trouble and needed to defer their mortgages, that's a pretty high number. So, you know, there's a lot of indications that the market could slightly soften, but with our market, you just never know. I mean, it really seems to be, you know, like a superhero. <laughs> so the next thing I'm waiting for, to be honest with you, is, you know, that that uh, three to four month period with no longer being able to defer payments and no help from the government in regards to CERB. A point that I personally, as a realtor, I'm waiting for. I, yes, I, I see that. I, I understand that. Um, well, I saw. I see that there's a few questions that have been asked. I'll try and type some of the answers to you just to, sh to make sure that we end on time. But uh, Kendra, do you mind if we move on to the active concealment section? Yes, for sure. Absolutely. Active concealment. <clears throat> So active concealment, this is a big one for me because this is basically when a seller doesn't tell you something very important about the property that could make a buyer walk away from a deal, something that's very, very important. I'm all about full disclosure. So an act of concealment is a big pet peeve with me. And so let's just move on to the poll question and it'll get an idea um, in regards to when what, what happens when this happens. So the question is, you are, a bu you are buying a home and find out two days before closing that the seller agreed with a nearby developer to have tiebacks, which is also known as strings, attached to the bottom of the property to prevent movement of the house during construction. This agreement was not registered on title and do you have to close? And, and I didn't even know that type, I mean, this is, this is, this is a good question. <laughs> so, the, so the question is, uh, do you have to close? A, yes, B, no, C, unsure, or D, it depends. So give it a few more seconds. So if you, if you find out that there's strings at the bottom of your house, your soon to be house that's attached to the ground, you have to close on the sale. Yeah. So I'm going to close the poll now. They, they, they add strings to the bottom of the house because there's a high likelihood that it's going to move. <laughs> yes, <laughs> you exactly. still have to close. It's going to shake. Huh, interesting. <laughs> so do you have to close? Uh, right. Uh, so 19% have said, yes, you have to close. 37% have said, no, you don't have to close. 30% said they're unsure. That's a good question. And 15% said it depends. So I'll share with you the correct answers. The majority of you got it right. No, this is a, you don't have to close because this is a defect going to the root of title. So you just don't have to close. And so the test is, would you be getting a pro the property, the same thing that you thought you were actually buying and was there any other way to find out about this defect except to be informed by the seller? And the difference between a concealment and a latent defect is like latent defect is like mold or termites that you could have or should have known. Um, and the buyer, the seller could have or should have known and didn't, didn't tell the information. So you can go into the basement and it may not be concealed and the seller knows about it, but just didn't tell you about it. But in this situation of active concealment is actively concealed. And I've dealt with that issue about two years ago. And in that situation, my client, who was the buyer, sued the seller, and we settled before going to trial. And then when you encounter that type of situation, you look for the difference in what the purchase price would have been if that was actually disclosed. Another example is the Wellesley case where they bought a house and the vendor knew about a foundation crack and deliberately acted to conceal it by painting over the crack. Nine years later, the foundation wall collapsed and the court said to the buyer that the seller must pay $100,000. So to reduce your chances of going to court and deal to, if you have to deal with this problem or you think you may have to deal with this problem, you should ask bef before you submit a binding offer, what work has been done to the property? Is there anything, there's a construction site, you know, one block away, do you have a deal with those developers or the city? 
And if the answer is yes, then you would ask for, you would ask, uh, you would requisition the information. What, what deal do you have? What work has there been done? And it answers a question from SB on title searches where a possible sentence in the agreement of purchase and sale is that the vendor has disclosed to the buyer any deficiencies that may affect title. So moving on, um, Kendra, just if, if these questions, if you can answer these questions very quickly, we have one more topic to cover. Mm -hmm. um, any penalties on new builds, any financing issues you, do you see? Any insurance issues do you see? So any penalties on new builds, I'm not aware of any penalties on new builds and, and even, and what I have seen over the years is that if there were penalties that were actioned against developers, next thing you know, they're just putting it into their agreement of purchase and sales that, you know, that, that doesn't count any, any longer. Um, I am seeing a lot of new uh, costs to buyers in regards to new builds. And for those of you that aren't realtors may be interested to find out that one of the things that's happened over the couple of years is that uh, it actually costs in some buildings, it's more expensive price per square foot for a new build than it actually is for a resale. Whereas a decade ago or 15 years ago, it was always that new builds were such great deals because price per square foot was so much lower than resale. And now we're actually seeing the opposite. But in regards to penalties on new builds, I'm not, uh, I, I haven't seen anything recently. Um, what financing issues do you see? Financing issues that I've seen are two. Number one is lenders actually just reneging on the mortgage days before you're supposed to close. And the second one, which is extremely becoming common, which is which was rare a while ago, and it actually personally happened to me recently, and And that is where the banks are appraising houses at a lot less than what the purchase price was. So for an example, you purchase a house for $700,000 and the bank appraises it at six twenty. dollars Now the buyer has to come up with the difference of that um, amount uh, upon closing themselves. Um, so it personally happened to me when I just recently purchased a new home. So um, those are the two financing issues that I am seeing right now. And then what insurance issues do I see? I'm not really seeing any residential uh, insurance issues at the moment arising out of COVID for my fellow uh, colleagues that might be on um, this seminar, please feel free to type in if you are seeing any insurance issues. Uh, but what I am seeing in regards to insurance issues is that in insurance, um, insurance has dramatically increased in regards to condo buildings. So over the last year, we have seen a large increase of monthly maintenance fees because insurance uh, fees have gone up so high. They've jumped astronomically over the last couple of years. Um, and I am seeing that a lot of businesses right now are having their insurance companies completely drop them right now um, in, during COVID. A lot of restaurants and bars. If I may so, chime in, Kendra, one insurance issue that I can see is that if people are working more from home and conducting more business from home, they may have to report that to their insurer if their property is insured just for residents. And if there is a problem in the future, the insurer may not um, cover them because they didn't properly report. That is a good point, Tanya. <laughs> Glad you're here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let's move on to the, next, the last topic. Kendra, would you like to introduce it? Yes, I love this topic, mixed use of property, commercial, residential. For those of you that aren't aware of these types of properties, there's a lot of them along the Danforth, along Bloor, St. Clair, Davin, uh, Davenport, where uh, on the main level, you will have a commercial use uh, of a building. It's got a retail store, a restaurant, and so on. And then above that, you normally have uh, one or two or even three apartments so the top part is residential the landlord leases those out and then the bottom is commercial so let's go to the poll question i love this one and we get to be judges in this one okay so you were the judge a landlord leased a property to a tenant under a single commercial lease the property is zoned as residential and a business office is permitted 
the property does not have a sign for the business and the tenants live on the property. The tenant defaulted on rent and within 15 days, the tenant was locked out for non-payment of rent. So basically that's a commercial lockout. What is your verdict? Does this lockout fall under commercial or residential property law? So A, commercial property law, B, residential property law, or C, unsure? And the answer will blow your mind. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, while you're voting here, we I've seen there's a number of questions. We not, may not get it to them all. So I will make sure that um, I'll contact you after this well, this webinar um, to answer your questions. I'll share them with Kendra in case they are uh, more real estate uh, brokerage type of questions. So ending the poll. Ooh, okay. So 47% <laughs> said commercial property law. 37% said residential property law and 17% played safe and said unsure. Okay, so I'm sorry. The majority of you are incorrect. The answer is B. The lockout was illegal and the tenant should be let back in. So what is important to the court is what the dominant use of the property was, not what the parties agreed it was. So in this situation, when there's very little commercial use, it will be seen as a residence and governed by that law. And this actually happened in the case of on the go shipping, which is on the screen before you. This is a COVID case. And what happened in that situation was that there was a heritage house that was zoned as residential. It was rented to on the go shipping under a commercial lease. Tenant moved in with his fiance and two dogs. The only part of the house that was used for the commercial purpose was an office on the main floor and the garage, which was used to park a, for a truck and a forklift. There were no business signs, customers or employees who worked at the property. The tenant who didn't re receive independent legal advice before signing the lease from a lawyer said that he didn't even know the difference between a residential and commercial lease. However, when the property was advertised on MLS, it was advertised as an office building and HST was charged for rent and the parties informed the judge at court that it wouldn't, HST wouldn't have been charged if it was a residential uh, lease agreement. So the tenant was locked out under the commercial lease agreement and wanted to be let back in under the residential law. The advantage to the tenant is that at that time, there was even a pause on evictions on for residential orders until the end of August. So the tenant would have been able to live in there for quite some time. So the court here said the dominant purpose of the tenancy is residential and therefore granted, governed by residential law. So the landlord had to let him back in. Other cases like Toronto Community Housing, this was actually a music studio, just a room rented by the tenant and the tenant wanted it to be governed by residential law. And the court here said, no, it's commercial. You don't live here. It's just for music. It's a business use. We're, we're not going to make it covered under residential law. The last situation of Taro versus you, in that situation, that's where there was a store at the bottom and the residence at the top. And the court said, this is governed by commercial law because the dominant purpose of this, if you living here is the commercial property, you just live on top and therefore it's governed by commercial law. So this answers a question from a few of you regarding rental properties, commercial lease issues and landlord rights. So to reduce your chances of going to court, you should, uh, make sure that there's some kind of clause in the lease uh, or paragraph that says the tenant will carry on business activity and ensure that business activity is actually defined within a, the premises during a certain time, failing which a landlord may uh, submit the appropriate application to evict the tenant. And uh, I dealt with this before with a, a client where it was a commercial lease and the client moved in and use it as a residence for many years. Landlords changed, the landlord said, I want this tenant out. And then we ended up settling because of the risk to the landlord that the lease would be seen as a residential lease, although it was initially supposed to be commercial. So those that summarizes it, um, our presentation. And there's a few questions for Kendra uh, about residential issues that may arise from multiple offers and land assembly valuations during COVID. Kendra, do you mind answering those? You have about a minute left. 
Okay, so residential issue or residential issues that arise from multiple offers. So again, we are seeing, as stated at the beginning, that um, you know uh, buyers are actually just ghosting these sellers. The other thing I'm seeing is that again, the house may not appraise at the house at the 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 price that you purchased it at because you've gone so high. Um, and then the other thing I'm seeing is that uh, a lot of listing agents lately are not notifying all interested parties uh, that there has been a preemptive or what a lot of people know as a bully offer. So an example is, is that when you're holding back offers and you for, to, for, for five days out and you receive an offer on the second date, as a listing agent, you must notify all interested parties. That would be parties that have made appointments to view the property and or viewed the property and or sent you questions inquiring about the property. And um, they're not notifying people about these preemptive offers and everybody's losing out. The buyers are losing out and the sellers are losing out. I just had this happen to me and my buyers, I have it in writing, would have gone $75,000 more than what they actually sold the property for. So sellers are losing out as well. So those are the few residential issues I'm, I'm seeing arising from multiple offers. Uh, and also a lot of buyers just taking that risk of not having a financing clause and not having a home inspection. That is a no-no. Uh, question from AB, land assembly valuations during COVID, not really seeing anything drastically changing other than definitely coming to the forefront now is homelessness and changing um, a lot of uh, taking some of these parcels of land and now um, putting them towards and allotting them towards uh, some, some housing for the homeless people um, has become a very big um, issue. And we actually are actually starting to see some court cases coming out of this happening. And that's it. Okay, so we it's now 12 o'clock. And I just wanted to say thank you to everyone for tuning in today, asking your questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to answer all the questions live. Um, I will definitely email you today to answer those questions that you may have. Um, it, Kendra, it was great working with you again. I, it's such a pleasure. I, I learned so much from you, so thank you so much. Um, if you have any questions about real estate, uh, selling property um, issues, you should contact Kendra. She's amazing, she's wonderful. Um, and I, I would be happy to answer any type of legal type of questions you may have. Uh, Kendra, I'm not sure if there's anything else you'd like to add. No, I think just a reminder that our next seminar will be before the end of the year and that we will be having a tax lawyer joining us, which I think is going to be great because we are, I, I, there is starting to be a little bit of uh, this wave happening of a lot of uh, Americans wanting to... <laughs> <laughs> now all like really seriously uh, purchase property here in Toronto. We are seeing that quite a bit. We're having a lot of purchases start to happen over the last few weeks. So um, that'll be, I think that'll be great. Well, well, thank you everyone. And thank you so much, Kendra. I hope you all stay safe and healthy and we'll see you again. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.